Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today I would like to tell you about the homotopy groups, the infamous homotopy groups. Um, we'll see that they are a little bit crazy, um, Swearsid spaces. So the definition isn't all that bad, as I, it's right here, Swearsid spaces. It generalizes a fundamental group, but there's a good reason why usually, well, let's say in the standard class on algebraic topology, you would learn the fundamental group and then not as a natural continuation the homotopy groups, but rather homology first, because homology is pretty cool. Homology is computable, homology is strong. A homotopy is a little bit, uh, uh, we'll see uh, what, I, what I mean. But anyway, so let's get started. Remember what the fundamental group was, okay? So this is just a reminder of what the fundamental group is. Um, all the nice pictures are linked in the description. So there was this nice site um, where they have really good animations of fundamental groups. So here's my space X, which is this space with a hole. So here's somewhere it's a hole. And uh, in this fundamental group picture, you choose the base point X. And what you do is you consider loops in your space. So here, this funny loop, and you measure them, how they arrange in spaces up to homotopy, okay. Right, as usual, up to homotopy. So the fundamental group measures how one can put loops in spaces, right? You put a loop in a space, whatever it is, so you use your space, uh, two holes, whatever. You have some points somewhere, you put a loop in here. This is really bad loop into the space. Uh, uh, so bear with me, I make my space a little bit bigger such that it actually makes sense. Okay, so this is now a loop in my space and you measure. Uh, how many different loops basically you have up to something like a homotopy, which moves uh, the loop around a little bit, right? And the formulation that people like to use is, well, you take a map from the interval into X, which has a, a boundary points move together. And this is just really a loop, right? You take an interval, uh, you throw it into your space in such a way that this here, this is F of, F of zero and F of one, uh, this would be my x, and you glue them together. And that's, of course, just the same as taking the interval and gluing end to end, and you create the circle. So this really measures, just the formulation is, you put interval in your space, and you assume that f of 0 is f of 1, right, n squared. But really what it is, is you put loops in spaces, uh, and you just measure how different they are, how different they can be, up to homotopy, just throwing loops into spaces and see what happens. It's kind of the idea of the fundamental group. And the natural generalization, which people came up with very, very early after they uh, de defined the fundamental group, is exactly this definition. Instead of looking at loops in spaces, so who says that you should put a loop, right? You could put something higher. Well, a loop is just an S1, right? The loop is just an S1. Um, so why not put an S2 in a, in a space and uh, see how this behaves, or an S3, or an S4, or whatever. And this is in the higher homotopy groups, the homotopy groups. It really is the same idea. So um, so this one is usually denoted by pi 1. Uh, and the 1 here corresponds to the fact that I put S1 in my space. So I would now denote those guys by pi n. And the n corresponds to what I put now S into my space. So really, this thing should measure how n spheres can be arranged in space up to homotopy. And the right formulation is exactly the same as before. So in this case, you take the interval and you glue n's together and you get a circle. You can do the same thing here. So you take whatever this would be n equals to this illustration, of course. So you take a square, this one here. And if you take the square and you now glue the whole boundary to a point, it's really like this balloon picture of the sphere. So the square is the surface of the balloon and you pull it together at one point, uh, which is then called X. And then you have a sphere in your space X. So here's my S2, it somewhere lives in my space X. And the formulation is uh, exactly the same as before. Instead of an interval, you have, uh, well, a, a cube, right? Um, zero, one to the N. Uh, N is a corresponding dimension. And yeah, of course, the uh, S1 is the loop, so fundamental group is the pi one. And that's the whole idea. So instead of looking at loops in spaces, you look at spheres in spaces. That sounds reasonable to me, right? But of course, remember, the fundamental group had this flaw 
that it really doesn't know much about higher dimensional spaces because it kind of ends at the two skeleton. And beyond that, it just can't tell the difference anymore. And maybe what you should do is instead of looking at loops, you should look at spheres and spaces. And this is exactly the pi n. And now you have one of them, um, of course, one group for each n. And there will be just the ways of measuring how an n sphere sits in your space. And it turns out that on first sight, this group, it will form a group um, exactly in the same way as a fundamental group forms a group. And on first sight, this group is actually much easier than the fundamental group. Turns out that this is always commutative from pi 2 onwards. So pi 2 is commutative, pi 3 is commutative, only pi 1, only the fundamental group might not be commutative. And the way to see this is exactly this illustration. If you have enough space and in higher dimensions, you always have enough space in some sense. You can always have one sphere and another sphere. And instead of putting this first, and this first, you just put this, pull it up, take the other one, pull it to the side, pull this one down, and you reverse the order. Exactly in this kind of type of illustration fashion like here. So you can just either slide this way and then uh, take the y here. Just think of this as being um, the identity here. And think of this as being the identity. And this is my. S2 or whatever it is, Sn, and here's another S2. And now I can just um, just read it differently. I can slide this S2 up, I can slide this S2 down, and then I can slide it to here and to here, and it kind of exchange uh, completely the positions. And indeed, you can show um, that this gives a commutative multiplication. So if the multiplication structure wasn't all that clear, remember that for the fundamental group, you just took a loop. And you took another loop and they ended at the same point, so just compose them. And you can do the same here, of course. You have a sphere that ends and starts at the point. You have another sphere that ends and starts at the point. You can compose them, you get two spheres that end and start still at the same point. So this gives you a multiplication structure uh, on this equivalence classes of uh, spheres and spaces. And as I try to illustrate, um, this actually turns out to be commutative. So it looks much more innocent, much easier actually than the fundamental group itself. Right? The fundamental group doesn't need to be commutative. In most cases, it actually isn't. It is more like a coincidence when it is commutative. Um, this is always commutative for all x, which I think is a pretty funny result. Uh, so we just think, OK, that sounds good. Now we have a group associated to each n, measures how spheres live in spaces, and they're actually commutative most of the time. Um, and that's exactly then the definition um, so for a topological space, we do exactly that. So we take uh, our um, whatever higher intervals so the cube, and we take a map from the cube into x, that's our sphere, and we demand that the boundary goes to one point, uh, which is just star, or whatever you call the point, x star, whatever it is, doesn't matter. And you take those equivalence classes, uh, modular homotopy of those maps. And the group structure is again given by concatenation. This is really just spheres and spaces by, and you concatenate them because they kind of start at the same point. So this gives you this fundamental, this homotopy group pi n. For each n, you have a group associated to your space, which is pretty cool. And of course, this measures higher information because now you have higher dimensional spheres and not just loops like for the fundamental group. Again, the usual nonsense, this is only a group up to homotopy, but in the algebraic topology, you work up to homotopy anyway. Um, and actually, the same argument as for the fundamental group will show that for past connected spaces, you can forget the end, the, the one chosen point, which was always a little bit silly for, or a little bit strange for the fundamental group that you have to choose the base point. You can kind of forget it for past connected spaces. Um, the only fun fact here is, and this is a little bit confusing if you see it for the first time, that really pass connectedness is enough, uh, which looks like a definition which should work for pass, right? Pass connected and not necessarily so for loops, but not necessarily for spheres. But actually, it does work for spheres as well. And kind of the illustration I have in mind is that you want to go from this point, whatever x, to this point y, and you have your sphere here, it sits at this point. And you just move it along uh, a pass. And as long as it's pass connected, and then it ends up here. And as long as it's pass connected, this actually works pretty well. And that's, that's what's going on. Um, so formally, you can kind of, if you want, you can just kind of shrink the boundary of the outside. So this is kind of the, the end is to the outside. You could shrink it a little bit 
I and then move it around at each at each slice here. Uh, so from 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 star to to s, for example, from star to asterisk here in this case, the two different boundary points, and then it just kind of moves the sphere along the path, and you just put it somewhere else. So here's my sphere in the middle in this picture. So the outside one here, let's say, is a blue sphere. Um, if I would do the outside one and I move it along the path to the inside one. This gives me an isomorphism of groups, so you can kind of forget the boundary point. As I said, what I find mostly surprising is the path connectedness is sufficient here. You don't need any higher order of connectedness. It's still path connectedness. And of course, the whole point of this construction is that this is a homotopy invariance, right? So if the spaces are homotopic, then the groups are isomorphic groups. And now they are uh, beating groups, and it's pretty easy to, to check. So you get something like Zs or Z mod twos or something like that all the time. Um, yeah, and that sounds like a pretty cool definition. Actually, fundamental group was oh, pretty useful. And well, it kind of the flaw was kind of that it kind of stopped at dimension two, latest three, and then it kind of doesn't want to do anything anymore. This looks much better. Um, and this indeed captures, uh, of course, if you take all ends together, this indeed captures quite a lot of information of your space. Uh, I will show you a, a formal statement in a different video. It's, it's called Whitehead Theorem. It basically says that um, you can detect homotopy of spaces by looking at the homotopy groups. Not quite, it's not quite as good as that, but almost. So quite close. But there's still a flaw, and actually it's a huge flaw. Uh, so let's have a look. So this is a table of um, homotopy groups of three years. So of course, the easiest object for the point, it's trivial. So the easiest object you would like to test this on is something like uh, uh, pi n of sk, right? And it turns out that we can't compute them. So the notion of homotopy groups is by now about 100 years old, and we can't compute homotopy groups of three years. So most of this table, which is, uh, so the pi n's go in this direction and the dimension of the spheres, the SK's go in this direction. Most part of this table is up to date, still not known, which is extremely shocking because the definition looks so harmless and we can't even compute it for spheres. This is mind blowing, right? This is, this is shocking. Um, and it's, it's actually worse. So here is, uh, for example, the slice for S2 so just the homotopy groups of S2, and they get pretty crazy. And this slice, the homotopy groups of S2, is up to date still not known. We can't compute that. And you really see strange answers. So here's a Z mod, uh, here's a Z mod 2, here's a Z mod 15, a Z mod 2, a Z mod whatever. Uh, it, it gets pretty crazy. Already for S2, it gets kind of arbitrary crazy. And um, it's not like, so don't get this wrong. It's not like we can't say anything. So there is kind of a funny thing. There's kind of a diagonal. So this thing in black here and below the diagonal kind of everything is known and above the diagonal kind of nothing is known. It's kind of a really strange situation right now. Um, so if you want to do this by hand already, pi three of S2 is, non, is a non-trivial calculation. So pi three of S2 is this one here. It should give you Z. And this is a non-trivial calculation. It's, it's actually related to the Hopf vibration. Really non-trivial. If you want to try this at home, be careful. Already this computation is non-trivial. And now imagine you would need to compute uh, pi 512 of S2. I'm pretty sure pi 512 is not known. I just took 512 randomly. It might be someone has computed that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's not. So I said again, even this line for S2 in general is not known. And this is a huge flaw of this invariant. Right? It's very strong. Uh, we haven't seen that, but I already told you it's very strong. It's uh, it has a nice definition. It's a natural generalization of the fundamental group. That all sounds very well. It all sounds very nice, but it is just impossible to compute. It's really, really crazy. And yeah, it, it's really, really strange. Um, so up to date, calculating the whole fundamental, the homotopy groups of the spheres is still a kind of an open and important problem in algebra topology. So people have turned away a little bit from that problem because it's just too hard and ask alternative questions like stable homotopy groups, which I'm not going to explain, um, of spheres or something like that. But um, still, I mean, this is crazy. Even 
a pi three of S two is not completely trivial to compute it. Anyway, um, I hope you're not too scared about homotopy groups. They're still very nice to define. And for subspaces, you can actually compute them, which is uh, very surprising because for spheres you can't. Anyway, um, I still hope you are not too afraid. Well, I'm very afraid of homotopy groups, but hopefully you're not. Um, and I also hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.